Again, welcome to Long Bridge Over the Potomac with Patrick O'Neill. I'm really thrilled about this topic. I think you're going to love it. Um, before there was a Long Bridge Aquatic Center, with which you're all hopefully now familiar, and a Twin Bridges Marriott Hotel off of 395, there was a long bridge over the Potomac connecting DC with Arlington. I'm delighted to welcome local historian, archeologist and author, Patrick O'Neill, who will discuss the history of the long bridge and its evolution into a major transportation artery for cars and rail. Patrick has spoken with us before about Virginia's presidential homes and he has kindly returned to give us some more insight into the Long Bridge and this important chapter of Arlington's transportation history. Patrick is a member of the Burke Historical Society and he's president of the Northern Virginia chapter of the Ar Archaeological Society of Virginia. In 2014, he was awarded the Fairfax Heritage Award by the Fairfax County History Commission. He was recognized for his outstanding work preserving, promoting, and protecting the history of Fairfax County, including 13 years researching and writing the treaties entitled To Annoy or Destroy the Enemy, The Battle of the White House and the Burning of Washington, revealing new insights into connections between events in Fairfax County and the writing of the Star Spangled Banner. Recently, Patrick's been delving into Arlington history and archeology. span He's been analyzing artifacts from the Ball Sellers House for the Arlington Historical Society. And hopefully, maybe we'll get a chance to hear about that sometime. Um, Patrick speaks widely on a broad range of historical subjects, and I'm thrilled and honored that he has made time to speak with us today. I'm going to go backwards a little bit. Here we go. Oh. So we're talking about the Long Bridge. Now, everybody knows where the 14th Street Bridge is. But the question is, do you know which bridge is the 14th Street Bridge? Because there's five bridges that go over in that same area. But the Long Bridge is the railroad bridge. Now, that's not the one that the Metro goes over. It's the one that the freight trains and Amtrak goes over. The old iron bridge with the old draw span. And so that's what we're talking about today. And there has been a bridge in that location for almost 200 years now, actually just a little over 200 years. So in 1791, when the District of Columbia is designated, which was 10 miles by 10 miles, half in the state of Maryland, half roughly in the state of Virginia, and that half is pretty much what is Arlington County, aside from the city of Alexandria today. But there is nothing going across the Potomac River to connect the two parts of the District of Columbia. So in 1808, the Long Bridge was proposed to be built by the Washington Bridge Company, and that was authorized by an act of Congress. It was finally uh, built and opened by May 20th of 1809. Now, we don't really know uh, uh, much about that bridge. We do know it was wooden, okay? And it was only for wagons. It's not a railroad bridge. Railroads had not yet, been, I mean, there are steam locomotives, but there are no railroads at that time. So this is just for wagon traffic going across the Potomac. And of course, people could walk across it as well. And this is a, a, a drawing of the District of Columbia showing the long bridge in 1814. Then the British come in August of 1814. And we know what happened at Bladensburg and we know what happened to the city of Washington. They burned a predominant number of the public buildings in Washington, including the president's house and the Capitol. They also burned the, the end of Long Bridge which was on the Washington city side because they didn't want the Americans coming back after them. The Americans had set fire to the Virginia side so the British couldn't come out of Washington DC and go into Virginia. So that part of Long Bridge was burnt at both ends. Now, the British 
at that time were going to try to uh, attack Washington, which they did, but they were going to leave in the Potomac River and there were ships that were coming up the Potomac River to, to save them, uh, British warships. But the army left Washington before these ships could come up and those ships went to Alexandria. Part of the defensive measures for Washington was uh, having a, a garrison at the end of Long Bridge to keep the British from coming over into Virginia. Now, after the War of 1812, Long Bridge is rebuilt and it's shown on maps of the District of Columbia ever since that time. Here it shows it in 1819. There's another version that was done in 1828. And what you're looking at here is the city of Washington. This is not the entire District of Columbia, but the first people that were designing, uh, Lafont, Pierre Lafont, that was designing the city of Washington, this is the area that he and George Washington envisioned was practical to lay out. And then they would expand upon that once the capital was uh, in full, uh, full steam ahead. So uh, the Long Bridge was important coming over from Virginia for that commerce of that early city. Here it is in 1838. And you can see the shaded areas are the developed part of the city of Washington at that time. Now, again, this is still almost uh, uh, 12, 13 years before the Civil War, but a lot has been happening in Washington at the time. Uh, the Capitol's been built, the President's House. They've been in Washington, D.C. now for about 18 years. They came in 1800 to 1801 is when John Adams, as President, moves into the White House, to the President's House. Now, in 1839, it, you see a lot of information going on in this map. Um, this is Long Bridge in 1839. And this is Alexander's Island that my cursor is going around here. We don't see that as an island today because when the Pentagon was built, they filled in the majority of this low spot here where the Arlington Arena is over in this area here. But they call it Alexander's Island. And it was called Alexander's Island after the Alexander family uh, that owned uh, part of Alexander, Alexandria. That's who it's named after as well. So Alexander's Island was lauded out. But you can see uh, down here at the Virginia end of Long Bridge, there is there are some buildings there. R.B. Mason is the, is the landowner there. And there's also some other farms uh, on the other side of the road. And you can see there's orchards and probably some cultivation there. And there was a lovely drawbridge at that time. This is the only depiction that we have of Long Bridge uh, prior to the big expansion in the Civil War. And uh, this was drawn in 1839. Now in 1839, another map is drawn. Of, of the Long Bridge area. And you can see it has wharfs. There's a steamboat wharf here, and there's Lynn's Wharf, Brent's Wharf, and Bull's Wharf. These are on the Washington side. The Virginia side doesn't have much of commerce. There was a little deep channel over on this side that ships would come up. The larger ships had to come up on the Virginia side, but there's no wharfs over there. In 1839, they're advertising a canal from Alexandria up to Great Falls and westward. And when you zoom in on that, you can see here's, here's the canal being planned. It's just off the map here, but here's Long Bridge again, and they're calling it Long Bridge. You can see the deep channel that goes along here. And that's the reason why there are no wharfs over here because that's where the waters are gonna get very rapid. So the wharfs are over on the District of Columbia side where the shallow channel allows them to come up and there is a gatehouse here and a, or a, a drawbridge here and a drawbridge over here. But these people could come up into Washington and also into the canal. This Tiber mouth, that's where the canal went up by the Capitol here. But that's, and here's a close up of that same image. So Jackson City, 
is one of these failed communities in life. And it was laid out in 1838. And you can see its plans for expansion here. This crops up in a desire to have part of the metropolis on both sides of the river. And Longbridge would partake, would be the center point of that. And when Jackson City was laid out, George Washington Park Custis, who is uh, the one that built Arlington, and that's Martha Washington's uh, grandson and George Washington's step grandson or adopted son, however you want to look at that, and his namesake. Okay, George Washington Park Custis is named after George Washington. And he gives a, a long speech at the dedication of Jackson City in 1838. He considers that one of his uh, finest accomplishments that he's going to plan this new city that's across from Washington. And here you can see all the streets that were going to be laid out on all the blocks and buildings that were going to be put in there. They had big plans for this. And then they also drafted this nice panoramic drawing. The viewer that stand standing and look at this view is up by Arlington House. So they're looking across the river at Washington and they're looking off to the right at the Long Bridge. And you'll see that in the very corner there, here's Jackson City right here. Beautiful romantic view, steamboat on the river, a couple of ships going through the locks. Everything's beautiful. You can see on the Washington side, lots of houses lining the river over there. Big plans for Jackson City, but it never happens. It never happens. There's never more than probably two dozen buildings there from what we understand. And we'll get into more of that later after the Civil War. So the a &W Railroad, which connected Capitol Hill to the Long Bridge on the North Shore, they had built their railroad by 1855 and across the river in Virginia, in Alexandria, by the end of 1857. The problem was the Virginia legislature had banned any other connections and tracks that were not placed on the bridge at this time. So the Virginia Railroad, the a and Railroad had not been able to put rails on Long Bridge before this mandate came. So for many years, Long Bridge, which was the newest version from the 18, late 1830s, that was designed to carry a railroad, but they hadn't put them on there in the time frame, so they had to have time transpire for that ra those rails to be put in there. So they had rails coming over to the northern edge in DC, and they had rails leaving the Virginia edge going to Alexandria, but nothing on the bridge itself. And in 1857, when Boschke drafts his famous map of the District of Columbia and Washington City, he does not show any rails on the bridge. And the blow up in the lower right shows just the bridge and no rails on there. And I'll clarify that statement in just a few minutes here. Civil War comes. When the Civil War comes, Long Bridge obviously is extraordinarily important to the defense of Washington and also in getting troops moving to the south that are all coming down through Washington City. So the first thing they do is take the old Long Bridge, which is now about 14 years old, and they fix it up some. So what you're seeing here is the superstructure above the old trestles. You can see how long these, these uh, uh, foundations have been there but they build a superstructure above it so it can handle the wagons and the troops coming across. And they put rails on that bridge at that time during the Civil War. Now, as we go through these pictures, the easiest way to know which is the old bridge, which is there at the beginning of the Civil War, is because it has a flat top, okay? So this is a view of uh, looking over across the, to uh, Washington. And if you see here, I've got, got it blown up here, but it's very hard to see. There's the US Capitol right there in that picture. So you know you're looking from Virginia over to Washington. <clears throat> now, at this same time, 
Oshke redrafts his map from 1857, and this time he shows rails on that bridge. So see, you can see that the railroad tracks now go over the bridge, and that's reflected in photographs we have. It's also reflected in newspaper articles at the time. In 1857, no rails are on the bridge, and in 1861, when the war starts, there are rails on the bridge. Second bridge was proposed very quickly into the war. By 1862, they, want, they needed to build another bridge across the river. The Union had crossed over into Arlington and Northern Virginia in early June of 1861. So they were in complete control of that part of Virginia. So they knew that they could build a bridge and not be harassed by the Confederate troops if they wanted to build such a bridge. So they started uh, building the bridge. You can see in the foreground here, wood that is being stockpiled for the formation of that new bridge. This is a view from the Washington side uh, showing the stockpiling of the wood before that bridge is built. So the second bridge is built. Let me go back to my comment about the old bridge having a flat top when they redid it in 1861. The new bridge that's built in 1862 are, are using uh, uh, beams that are arced for more pressure, being able to hold load, be more load bearing. And so whenever you see this rounded top on the bridge, you know that it's the second bridge, the one from 1862 that goes over the river. Now this time, the old bridge has rails but you can also see there is a path for wagons to go by over here on the left. But on the new bridge, they're ready, but the rails have not yet been placed on this second bridge because the railroad is still using this path. So this is just after the new bridge has been built. Now, <clears throat> just a few months later, you can see that the rails have been taken off the old bridge and now it's only for pedestrian or wagons and the rails have been, their rails have been added to the new bridge. What I do not know is if they were brand new rails or if they just transferred the old rails from the old bridge to the new bridge. Don't know, not, not really material, but just letting you know that it's possible they transferred them over. This is a photograph on the Washington side of the bridge showing the two drawbridge areas. Here's the old drawbridge from the old bridge. And this is the new area where, where boats come underneath. They have a drawbridge there, but they're not letting large ships come up there. So they're basically, if you can go underneath the bridge, you can go through. And this is another view of the new bridge. And now the rails have been added. Another view of the new bridge. And these are the, the two drawbridge areas. This is taken from the Washington end. Now this is uh, the, old, the gate, uh, old entrance that, that goes through the bridge over on the Virginia side. And you can tell because you're looking over here, you see the US Capitol is in the background. So we know that this is on the Virginia side. And so they're keeping this open for the larger ships that go up the river. I do not believe that this was, uh, that any ironclads or anything went above this bridge. Like today, it is very difficult and very shallow for large ships, particularly ocean going vessels to go as high up to Georgetown or up by Roosevelt Island, which back then was still called Mason's Island. But smaller craft could indeed come through here for transportation. Now, you're, the, these gentlemen are standing on the new bridge, and you can see the old flat top bridge on the right. And even on this smaller side that's not uh, covered with the, the superstructure, you can see them using the beams for load bearing here as they put the bridge together. This is the old bridge uh, before it was dismantled sometime during uh, the Civil War. And this is the old bridge where it's on the Washington side. And you can see 
This is where the gatehouse was. These houses here were where soldiers stayed and they would patrol and watch who went over the bridges. That way, if there was anybody trying to attack Washington, that they could stop them. There were gatehouses. You had to go inside a, a small fort on the south side of the river. You had to go inside of a, of a stockade to be processed before you were allowed to go up into Washington if you were coming from Virginia. And that's what they're showing here. And the same thing with these block houses here. They're using them to, for soldiers to stay in in bad weather and they can guard that bridge. And in Harper's Weekly and lots of other places, these, these drawings and pictures are being pushed everywhere across the nation, showing them that the nation's capital is being protected. I like this particular image because I found a colored version. That was pretty cool. So maybe we just see things in the newspaper if you don't realize that the original artist might have put them in color. So this is showing Fort Jackson and Fort Runyon, the two forts closest to Long Bridge. But you can see in Northern Virginia here, all the other forts, there were lots of forts. There was a ring of forts all the way around Washington, DC. But of all the places they needed to protect, probably none was as, as important as connecting across Long, Long Bridge and keeping that bridge open. Here's another one of those stockade areas where wagons came in, were checked out before they could go over the bridge. And in 1864, a map was drawn of the bridge. And this is the only map that we know of, that I know of, that shows both versions of the bridge. The one that's in red is the original bridge that was uh, probably 1930 or 1830 to 1865. And the second one in blue is the one that they built in 1862. And you can see the rails are on the one on the right, which is the southern most bridge or east southern eastern most bridge, whatever you, direction you want to say. So war is over, the old bridge is taken down, and the 1862 bridge remains for several decades. So around 1900, Jackson City comes for, to the forefront in relation to Long Bridge. Jackson City never had more than a couple of dozen buildings in it. But you can see here, they're all right next to the bridge. Well, Jackson City was a, uh, a place of opportunity. <laughs> um, if you like to gamble, play cards, horse race, box, anything that you could gamble on, that was Jackson City. Jackson City was called the Monte Carlo of the South. Although I don't know whether James Bond would have ever come here. Uh, don't know, don't know whether so people were showing up in tuxedos. But we do know that where Jackson City is concerned, it's right there on the bridge. So everybody that came over from Washington DC would come over there and gamble. And then they go back to Washington. A lot of Virginians would come up but in, in Washington, there's lots of people coming over from Washington to go to Jackson City. And by 1900, this has become a very big point. Alexandria, city of Alexandria wants Jackson City cleaned up. Washington, D.C. wants Jackson City cleaned up. But the people in Jackson City don't want to be cleaned up. So you can go through the newspapers at the time, and I'm going to go through several of these, just showing you highlights. This is showing pool selling and faro games at Jackson City, okay? Bookmakers find a resting place at the Virginia end of Long Bridge. Monte Carlo moved, see? Monte Carlo, there you go. The pool room prospects of Jackson City. Racing at St. Asaph's, that's the racetrack that's nearby, okay? Bookmaking and pool selling under Mooshbach Law. Mooshbach was the local constable, and, and he was trying to clean Jackson City up and passing all these laws. And they said, okay, thank you for passing all these laws, and they ignored them. And so uh, they kept having problems. The racetracks would shut down, and the next week they'd open up again. 
uh, the gambling, the card places, because, you know, you can just pick up and move and when the constables come by and then you're right back in business the minute they leave. So the sheriff closes Jackson City Sheriff of Alexandria. Now, this is 1894, but it's not closed. It's closed, but it's open back up. If you see the last couple lines, it says there will be racing and pool selling within six weeks under a charter granted by the state. They shut it down, but they keep reopening it again. So they have all this pressure from the city, but they want it suppressed, they want it shut down. This is the national thing is to shut down gambling around this time period. And so uh, it's no different here. It was burned down part of it, arsonists, accidentally set fire to Jackson City, trying to shut it down. And finally, 1901, 1902, when they're getting ready to build the new bridge, then the last of Jackson City is finally shut down. And here you go, pool room is still open though, because they haven't bulldozed the buildings that they're in. So until they bulldoze or burn those buildings, they're gonna stay open. So they had to finally bulldoze those buildings. And here's a, 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 a fitting end, I guess, to this is showing the, the wildlife at Jackson City here. Now, some of the things concerning the bridge, people would walk over from Washington, they gamble, and then many of them were mugged, murdered, killed, whatever you wanna say on their way back to Washington. They'd find people in the river floating on a Sunday morning or on a Monday morning, or people would come back Having been mugged, they had lost all their money. So the Long Bridge, it was, it was a, a very rough place down there by Jackson City. Here's some buildings showing the Monte Carlo of the South. I think that everybody would have loved to have gone over there at least once. Sure. <laughs> so 1903. 1903 is pivotal for the city of Washington. It is when the big expansion that you see today happens. They're thinking outside Florida Avenue, which up until that time was called Boundary Street. Okay, everything north of Florida Avenue and New York Avenue had not been developed yet. So they're looking into suburban life, building trolley lines out there to have people build out, move out there and come back into the city. It's the year that Union Station is being planned and the new railroad corridor coming in from the Northeast. And on the southern part, a new traffic pattern in the city of Washington crossing over into Virginia. Now, the black area here, that's the long bridge, the railroad bridge with the wagon path on the side of it. You have a wagon path on the side of it. But this is where they plan the earliest versions of the bridges that we have there today. This one here, oh, let's see, I think I have a closer up shot. So this, line of proposed railroad bridge, that's the railroad bridge that exists today, this bridge. Then they were gonna build a highway bridge on the other side. And we'll talk into what that evolves into today. That bridge has been uh, uh, taken out two different times, but the railroad bridge is still exactly where it was starting in 1903. The highway bridge as it was coming in was supposed to curve around the St. Asaph Railroad tra uh, racetrack that was here. And so here you can see it curving around. Here's still parts of Jackson City down here. And that's what they had to shut down before they built the bridge. Now, a 1927 aerial photograph shows that they that the, the, the railroad, the road, the highway road was supposed to go around the track, but they actually shortened the track. So they moved the edge of the track over here, but you can still see the arced remnants of the old St. Asa uh, Raceway here. And this is where the railroad came through right here. And that's an old map showing the Asaph, St. Asaph Railroad track, a uh, racetrack here and where the railroad track came right through it. So that earlier construction version did not really meet it at the end, they had to change it. Now, 1927, this aerial photograph shows the Arlington Amusement Park or Luna Park. And that was a big 
uh, area over here along there is it's close to where the Arlington Arena uh, Marina is today and so that area over here had a huge amusement park over there you can see a carousel here a lot of buildings here that had different functions and then people would just come down to the beach and go swimming here's a postcard of it here you can see that beautiful biplane flying over and you can see the long bridge the railroad bridge in the background here they had canoes it was a beautiful, wonderful, magical, mystical place to go to. Um, and uh, But Luna Park's been gone for a long time. So that 1903 highway bridge, not the long bridge, but the highway bridge, originally was built for wagons to cross over, as well as trolleys, electric trolleys that would go down as far as to Mount Vernon. That's when Mount Vernon's trolley line came into place, was across this bridge. And later on, the highway bridge was converted to vehicular traffic, of course, when wagons went out and, and cars came in. And here's a photograph here. This is the railroad bridge here, and this is that highway bridge. Technically, this is the first version of the 14th Street Bridge here because the Long Bridge is never supposed to be called the 14th Street Bridge, although people do because they're confused. They don't know what it is, but the railroad bridge has always been Long Bridge. And this highway bridge is the first 14th Street Bridge because here's 14th Street right here going right across because here's 16th Street going by the White House here. This is the railroad bridge or the Long Bridge in the foreground, the highway bridge in the background there. This is taken in the 1930s. By 1960, They've got modern traffic. They've got concrete roads going to the 14th Street Bridge or the, the, the uh, highway bridge. But this is the next renovation, the next phase of highways coming in. Because in the 1960s, that's when the majority of the bridges that are there now, you would recognize these bridges. So they're building this bridge here next to the highway bridge. These are the northbound lanes of the 14th Street Bridge. And when you go out on, that, on this bridge, when you look, when you're going north, you look to the right. First, you see the Metro Bridge, then you see the Long Bridge, the Railroad Bridge. So this is what we call the 14th Street Bridge today, but it's got a different name and I'll tell you that in just a minute. But you can see that next to the old highway bridge before they tear it down in the background. So over the years then, this is what we've come to today. So this is the railroad bridge and they call it now the long bridge again. When they built these other bridges, they had just been calling this the railroad bridge. But then they started using the term long bridge and that's what the railroad bridge goes by now. The Fenwick Bridge, that's where the yellow line of the Metro crosses right here. So when you look out of the Metro, you can look to the east and you see the railroad bridge and the west, you see the 14th Street Bridge. But the 14th Street Bridge northbound, that's called the Arlington D. Williams Jr. Bridge, okay? And that's the northbound lanes. Then when you come over on the very north part, the first of the westbound spans was the, now called the George Mason Memorial Bridge. That's the northern part of those two bridges. And the Rochambeau Bridge is the south part of that, which they're northbound or those are the um, HOV lanes coming in. That's the northbound HOV lanes coming in right there. So these are the bridges that exist today. So we've come a long way from that little bridge over the river in 1809 to what we have here 200 years later. This is another view, a modern view of the bridge system here. But the railroad bridge still exists. It's been there since 1903. The last time the drawbridge or was pivoted, I should say it's not a drawbridge that it goes up, it's a bridge that pivots sideways. And the last time it was open was in 1969, but it's in serious need of repairs. And everybody knows that. 
It's used now for Amtrak and for freight trains. The other bridge, the Fenwick Bridge, is where the Metro goes over. So these are plans to build a new railroad bridge on the north side or upstream from the current railroad bridge or long bridge. And to the north of that, between it and the Metro Bridge, there are plans to place a bike pedestrian bridge. Now, this report is only about a year and a half old, but I have no idea whether or not it's finalized, it's good to go, or they're still making recommendations, I don't know. It is possible it's part of the Build Back Better bill, I don't know, <laughs> who knows. I think it's interesting, they still plan to keep Long Bridge intact, at least until they get the new bridge built. I haven't heard whether they're gonna tear it down afterwards or not. But let's talk about the history that's involved with that. We've talked about all the history here. And it would be easy to assume that because of all the modern construction, that the entire city of Jackson City was wiped out in 1903 when that new highway bridge and a new railroad bridge was built. This is an early 1930s image aerial photograph of the area. And it does look for all practical purposes that Jackson City, as well as Luna Park, those areas that were the footprint of those two places are completely blitzed. However, this 1934 aerial photograph showing the George Washington Memorial Highway shows that the old dirt landform of the earlier Long Bridge is still intact. This is the modern Long Bridge here that was built in 1903. But this dirt finger, if you will, was where the old Long Bridge was. And you can still see the faint outline of that dirt berm as you look here in this era photograph in 1934. Here it is in 1903. Here it is in 1934. Now we're gonna show some overlays. This is the, 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 the dirt finger where the old bridge, you can still see the line here. So this is where the bridge came across. We're gonna put that 1903 photograph on top, or map on top of it, showing where all that is and where all these buildings are here, concerned to where that dirt, that landform is and where the mod, this is where the modern bridge is coming through here. And here you can even line up all the trust, the, the uh, peer supports that are underneath that bridge. Now, as an archeologist, about 20 years ago, we were doing some work down by the railroad bridge to see if we could find any evidence that Jackson City was still there. And so when we did, were down there, we found a brick foundation in this area here. And I believe it's the brick foundation of this building here. That means, under here, all of the foundations of these buildings probably still exist because they built that area up. They did not dig it down like we do today. They take everything out, they built up, and they so they bulldozed those foundations on the surface and then brought in dirt and filled up on top of it. And so when we were doing it, we brought a backhoe out on this is the hike and bike path there underneath the bridge and we found that brick foundation right here. So as they build this new bridge, I'm hoping they're gonna do more archeology span and see if they can find out more information about that because that's directly related to Long Bridge and Jackson City. And, and, and it's, it's very important that they do that because they, they don't tend to, uh, uh, when they're building such a huge project, they don't wanna do any archeology span because they think it'll slow them down. It won't slow them down. So here are four different views of Long Bridge. The top one is 1839. This one is 1861. They build the new bridge, 1862 in the Civil War. And 1903, they build the current railroad bridge, the Long Bridge right here. So you see how it's changed over almost 200 years. Okay. And that's my history of the Long Bridge. So, um, Pat Burke has written, just a tidbit of personal information. 
Her great grandfather, Francis Patrick Burke, was a draw tender for the Long Bridge as listed in the 1870 census. That's very cool, Pat. That's awesome. Um, so she's delighted to hear the history of the bridge. Well, I hope I've done, I've done your uh, great grandfather some justice and I hope I'm right. So he doesn't come back to haunt me. <laughs> but that's pretty oh, I, awesome. That's, that's yeah, cool. That, it, that is awesome. I was so delighted to see this presentation being offered. Um, I have a question. Sure. Uh, where did you get all the wonderful photographs and maps and pictures? It's my way. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so uh, truly in modern times, you can get access to a lot of this stuff if it's online. But most of these images I got about 30 years ago. Okay, so before we had all this digital stuff. So I would go to the National Archives, go to the Library of Congress. That's where a lot of these images are. There's so many things that you have at the National Archives and Library of Congress, plus the Virginia Room, Fairfax County. You can find a lot of stuff. Uh, Arlington uh, Library, the Virginia, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, they call it the Virginia Room there on Quincy. Uh, but they have tons of stuff, lots of stuff. All this stuff exists, but few people know where to find it. And most of the time you'll go somewhere, I'll go somewhere and I'll stumble across it, okay? Um, one of the things I was hoping by now, and I mean 2022, that every library uh, inventory would be put on the internet. Um, think about it. You know you have stuff in your local library in your local history section, but it doesn't come up during Google. OK, you can't find it unless you go into that library system and that's at a university that's uh, like the Library of Virginia. All these libraries have all this wealth of information and maybe some of it's online on their website, but they don't allow anybody to search on a global level their inventory, their, their catalog. And I think that so much stuff could be found, you know, if, if you do that. That's why when I find stuff. Um, I put in there, I am big on visualization. And, and uh, uh, I tell people, I says, I've got 500 slides in an only hour to show it to you. If you don't know, I just showed you 88 slides, okay? It doesn't seem like it, but I put them together as if I'm talking to you. I don't give you one slide and then start telling you what to imagine. I try to show you what it is or I'll make my own graphic trying to show what I'm trying to say because pictures speak a thousand words and I can but 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 there there's lots of places there's a lot more I actually called out some of the other pictures I had because there's just it's just too overwhelming to put in there at one spot but there's just it just there's stuff all over the place if you want any of these images by the way Pat um Sheila can give you my email address, okay? All right, or or I can give you my. Well, let's see. I don't know how to do that. I guess what I put it in. Put it in the chat. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat here. Hold on. I can't talk and type at the same time. Hold on. Um, yes. Okay. Now, when you see that there is an L in the middle, it's Patrick L O'Neill at verizon.net, okay? You guys are welcome to, to ask for any of the images if you want to. If you can't remember what it was, say you had something that was like this, I'll, I'll find it, you know, I have all these. And these are all cropped out of a larger picture. Most of these are huge pictures and, and I have very detailed uh, uh, versions of them as well that are high resolution, so as, as much as I can. But that's my way, that's my way, all right. Um, let's you've see. got a got... ton of questions coming All in right. on the chat. So when was Luna Park torn down? Um, I think it's still there by the by World War II, but it, it takes somebody else from Arlington. I think it goes away when the Pentagon is built, um, roughly. Okay, I know it's there during the Depression, but it's torn down because the Pentagon is being built. I mean, that, that's a wartime gets rid of Luna Park. They build the marina. I think the marina is only built after the Pentagon is built. 
but I could be wrong about that. Somebody else would have to find out. But anyway, all these things come about. World War II is a big difference on the landscape down in that Luna Park area. Um, I did not find any evidence of Luna Park because I was looking on the other side of the bridge. Okay. Um, again, I, so archaeologists are supposed to be called in when they're doing any construction project using federal or state monies. But the question is whether or not they will recognize that there still might be something there or will they just say, oh, it's been so destroyed, nothing. I've, I've talked to Matt Berta. He's the archaeologist with George Washington Parkway. He's the one I was working for when we found this foundation. And I asked Matt, I said, Matt, are you showing this stuff to the state and feds? And he goes, yeah, hopefully they'll pay attention. But, you know, sometimes things happen, you know. Um, but, uh, but I think that a lot of the Luna Park area was blitzed. And when we're looking at back at that one photograph I showed, that area over there looks pretty rough. But I don't know for certain. So, but I didn't find any because I wasn't in that area. Um, Linda asks, am I aware of any historical fiction that centers around the Long Ridge? Oh, um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, not that I'm aware of. I, I don't think there's a, a historical romance that deals with Long Bridge, you know, <laughs> but, um, but easily could. I mean, with, with Jackson City, you know, you, you could come up with some colorful stories, you know. So Linda, you go ahead and, and write one, okay? And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get somebody to get in there and do that. You can tie it in between Washington, D.C. and Jackson City and maybe Arlington and the Custises or Robert E. Lee or something like that, you know, okay? Which one of the bridges did Air Florida flight? Okay, if I remember correctly, the northbound 14th Street Bridge is the one that the uh, plane hit, okay? Um, imagine as it's coming down, by a miracle, it missed the railroad bridge. And I say that because the fact that that plane hit and landed on top of the ice, still relatively intact and was above the ice until the ice broke and it sank, okay? If it would have hit the railroad bridge, it literally would have pulverized probably or been flipped or any number of things because the railroad bridge would not have been, it couldn't bounce off the railroad bridge like it could off the 14th street bridge, okay? And, uh, and it bypassed the Metro bridge. The Metro was being built. It, it, I don't know if it had started running yet in 1982, but the bridge was there, um, but imagine it, it could have easily knocked, knocked a train off, but I can't remember if, the, if when, I think the Metro on the yellow line, I think that was maybe going by 81, but I, somebody else will have to figure that out. But I, I, I know somewhere somebody said that the bridge was there, but they couldn't remember when, when, the, uh, uh, when they started running trains across it. Um, let's see. One of the maps showed Turnpike on the Virginia side leading to the Long Bridge. Um, it could be Columbia Pike um, because I know that up the hill um, past the Pentagon where, uh, where the, the Air Force Memorial is now, isn't that Columbia Pike up at the top of the hill there? Somebody help me out there. You know, where those annex buildings used to be? It is. It's Columbia okay. Pike. Yeah. So, so I believe that 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 is Columbia Pike come that turnpike they're talking about is Columbia Pike coming down there. Yeah. There's so many um, like the mixing bowl at 395, 95, and 495. That south part of the river uh, uh, there at by Long Bridge has got such a spaghetti atmosphere, it just it drives you nuts. That's why I'm saying don't worry about what is the 14th street bridge because you, it, it gets confusing. All of them are technically the 14th street bridge. They just have different names. <laughs> Long bridge is only the railroad there. Yeah. Um, where was the Western terminus? Oh, I don't know where the Western terminus Columbia Pike. Um, when you say the Pike was successful business, most of the turnpikes were at the time. Okay, 
uh, they were needed so they could develop. But as time went on and counties were formed and county governments were getting highway funds for the state and raising their own taxes, then the need for the turnpikes dissipated. So a lot of times they didn't let the, they didn't force these people out of business but I think that they might have been some, some, some sort of compensation for them because they're buying up uh, uh, the road. They're basically buying the road like uh, when the state of Virginia took over the Fairfax County Parkway, Fairfax County had built the entire st uh, structure and they're, they're not just turning it over, the state is giving them something back in return, but I don't know what that was, okay? Um, so I think the turnpike, most of the pikes, the turnpikes, so the, the paid roads, they're, they're, they're good for what they were started to be, uh, but I don't think anybody ever made a lot of money off of them, you know, but they're invaluable because they helped transportation and communication and importing and exporting of goods into an area, helping people get around, so they're invaluable if they're not financially uh, sound. They're, they're good just for all the other things that come from them. I know Columbia Pike went, I'm sorry, that was Little River Turnpike, went through um, to Fairfax County Courthouse. Right, but, right, right. But, that's, but yeah, yeah, that's yeah, different yeah. Turnpike. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure Wikipedia, if somebody wants to look on their, on their computer, I'm sure Wikipedia has it on there. <laughs> um, there were two Luna Parks, Carol writes, the other one was at the corner of what is now Glebe and Route 1. Oh, okay. Glebe and Route 1. Oh, I didn't know that. It is the famous one where the elephants escaped. Oh, okay. Okay. I remembered hearing about this elephant story. I don't remember much about it, but that was down in Glebe and Route 1. I know where that's at. Huh. And that was also called Luna, Par Luna Park. Okay. I'll have to look into that. All right. So does anybody else have any questions? Don't have to put them in the chat. You can just ask me here right now. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourselves, turn on your camera, ask your question. We'd love to hear from you. I have a question about uh, the Star Spangled Banner, which okay. you, uh, I was reading about Congressman Joel Broyhill, and he he want he didn't think that the version that of the Star Spangled Banner that was being played when he was a congressman was true to the original uh and he wanted he wanted to make an official version um but it it that was totally new to me uh it, it's always sounded the same to me so do you know anything about that so there there, there depends on 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 what you think and and what you know okay so the question is, is he talking about something of when he was a kid? Um, we don't have Whitney Houston singing it 100 years ago, okay? Uh, we also don't have Roseanne Barr singing it 100 years ago, screaming it like she did. Um, but the words, the stanzas that are still there are the right ones. But in the last 40 to 50 years, we have added a much more... Uh, emotional uh, lean to it. And that's why several people uh, 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 try to outdo those that have come before them and trying to either pause longer, sing it slower, more with more emotions and stuff. But the original poem that, that Francis Scott Key wrote um, was set to a, a drinking song, okay? Uh, uh, an acronym, uh, 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 you'd have to Google that again. I don't have it in front of me. But the tune is the same in which we sing today, but it's sung differently back then. And during the bicentennial in 2014, I heard this time and time again from those reenactors that were trying to say, this is how they used to sing it, okay? It was, it was a, a bar song, okay? It's, oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early night? It's like a ditty that you're singing on board a ship or whatever, you know? And we are the ones that add this emotion to it. Now, this person you're talking about that once it sung like it were when you were younger, is he talking about that? 
because he's not that old, <laughs> but, but easily 40, 50 years ago, if you, if you listen to any of the recordings from the 1930s or 1940s that are singing the Star Spangled Banner, they're singing it like an, not an opera, but uh, very formal, very prim, very proper, okay? Oh, say, can you see by the, as opposed to, oh, say, um, pardon my lack of singing ability, but, but they're not getting theatrical about it. And it's very possible that that's what he's talking about. I don't know without talking to him directly. But I do know the original version that Francis Scott Key uh, planned was to a, bar, a, a, a drinking song. It's the same tune, just sped up with a little bit different emphasis on the different lines. And then if you take the lines of his poem, that's the lines of the song. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light? And it, it, you know, you're going through those different lines. So you've got to start and finish it. Um, it's like those of you that, 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 that are Catholic, when we're doing uh, the chants, okay, the Gregorian chants, you're, you're, you, you could do a Gregorian chant to the Star Spangled Banner if you wanted to as well. And I've done that before, but anyway. <laughs> um, now, interestingly enough, I'm gonna plug the Star Spangled Banner for a moment. I don't know if any of you that are on here now have heard my talk about the War of 1812 in the area. But the same rocket ships that were firing rockets that had the red glare and the same bomb vessels that had bombs bursting in air at Fort McHenry on August 24th, 1814. A week and a half earlier, were up in Alexandria and they were the ones that were there that, that were looting the town uh, after the attack on Washington but the British soldiers had already left. So these Navy warships came up and then they went down to try to leave. And the American forces at Belvoir, which was called the White House Landing. And at the White House, that's where they engaged these ships for five days. The main, <coughs> the main British fleet that was over in the Chesapeake Bay turned and came up the Potomac River looking for them. And that and Francis Scott Key was already on board the ships when they turned to come up the Potomac River. But these ships here at Alexandria had gotten past the American forces at Belvoir. And when they got down by uh, the 301 bridge uh, down there, which wasn't there at the time at that area, that's when they decided to go to Baltimore. So. The only reason they went to Baltimore is because the Americans that were here at, at, uh, at Alexandria and Belvoir, and many of them were for Arlington County because that militia group went down to the White House at Belvoir. And so they were getting shot at by the same rockets and the same bombs bursting in air that were there when uh, Francis got key penned the, the national anthem. So that's your part in it too, so. Oh, oh, we do have something else here. Hold on. Uh, I was on the Metro. Oh, Barbara writes, I was on the Metro that night and pulled into Smithsonian Station after the accident. We were told to leave the train, had no idea what was going on. Well, wait, is that a different? Well, what I think there was first a reminiscence of the Metro accident on the same day as the Air Florida crash. There was subsequently oh. a metro accident close, oh. close by. Oh, oh uh, uh, really? At the same time? Wow. Yeah. So wow. Uh, one, but they had one no message idea they were above is, wow. is to say the metro accident was just north of the 14th Street Bridge wow. and a tunnel south of the Federal Triangle Station. 25 were injured and three killed. Wow. And wow. then comes Barbara's um, chat message. Wow. Okay, okay. So, so my, my tie in to the uh, plane crashing into the bridge, I was at Kansas State University. Okay, I was a sophomore that year. And one of the guys in our uh, dorm um, was down in the TV room, they had cable, we didn't have cable in the dorm rooms, but at the end of the hall, the floor had a, a TV with cable. 
and headline news was on and they were showing the accident as in because you guys know it here because it was live but that's from your local television okay but imagine here i am out in kansas first time ever that anybody else outside of your metro could see something transpire on a national level as it happened you know and that was extraordinary. We were glued to the set. Why would we be glued to the set? Because it was it was amazing that we could see this happening halfway across the nation. And I remember that completely. And so when I first came back here, I went I went over to the bridge and said, "Oh, that's where it happened." And I remembered. I don't remember his last name. Who was the guy that jumped in? Larry Scutnick. Scutnick. Yeah, Larry, I remember Larry Scutnick jumping in, and we were showing it. And we're going, "Oh my God!" You know, oh I remember God. that guy's name. Here it is, forty years ago. And uh, it's extraordinary. So, yeah. yeah, that's a scary thought. That was 40 years ago. And we remember it like it was yesterday. Absolutely. 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 And I remembered how cold that water must have been. Oh, and that, yes. That, those, you know, just, it was a nasty, nasty day. Yeah. Yeah. Those poor people, you know. Yes. All right. Does anybody okay. else have any other questions? That's all for the chat. Anybody else want to throw in a final one before we end? Going once. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Good. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to know if you're going to do any more uh, bridge uh, bridge histories, like uh, Chain Bridge, maybe, or um, Memorial Bridge. You know, I, have, you I haven't gotten there yet, but I wouldn't say no. But I have I have over seventy five PowerPoint presentations, and so I I I add add all the time, but I don't usually seek out anything. Um, opportunities always present themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine you are very much in demand. Yes, and we really especially appreciate your making time for us. Thank oh, you. Very good. Very good. You may follow up. Anybody else? Going once, twice, three times. Thank you so, so much, Patrick. This All was, right. again, so fascinating, All truly. Right. The way you present it, I mean, it brings these bridges alive. I mean, it's yeah. they're just bridges, but they were fascinating. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. really fascinating. Thank well, you. I do, I, I do have a talk on handmade bricks. I used to say, fired earth. Why should we care? <laughs> you know? Cute, cute. Well, that fits in with the Lorton Workhouse a lot. No, they those made aren't handmade bricks. bricks, though. Those aren't handmade bricks. Those are machine made. We're talking oh. colonial time. That's the thing. See, you now you're going like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you get that a lot, though. Yeah, yeah, because very you know much. So, so yeah. much. Yes. Well, I, 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 Bob Sonderman from the National Park Service, he called me the brick guru one time. And, and, and the reason he says that he says he knows pat he says pat you're asking all these questions about handmade bricks and since people don't know the answers you're finding the answers so you're always going to be tag you're it now that you're the handmade brick guru and i said oh okay and so one time i said i said well bob didn't you call me the hand uh, the, the the brick god he goes only a guru don't get over you know <laughs> Yeah, you're getting ahead of yourself there. Yeah. <laughs> thank all you right. so very, very much, all Patrick. Very this was Goodbye. wonderful, superb. Right. And thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Stay right. well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.